All right, welcome to our Chapter 1 Introduction to .NET Lecture. So right up front, let me kind of apologize about this lecture and that it's one of those introductory lectures that we just have to kind of make it through so it can be a little bit boring. So please stick with me. This is also the kind of lecture that a lot of it might go over your head right now because we're just learning these concepts it's the first time you've ever heard them so I would make yourself a note and this is a lecture I really think you could gain a lot of in like a couple weeks from now re-watching it and I think a lot of these concepts will then finally sink in after you you've used .NET and you've used Visual Studio and C Sharp a little bit more the other thing I quickly want to talk about is just where you're at in college right now as far as computer science goes and if you're most like most of my students you're a junior you're a senior you have a year left you know whatever it is but you've taken enough computer science classes now probably your head is spinning and you feel like maybe you're getting behind in some concepts or a little bit lost that is perfectly normal everyone feels this way I feel this way you know especially when I was in college so please just stick with it that's the other reason in my class you'll see that I actually start off pretty slow with a lot of concepts you've probably already learned but it'll be new to you for C sharp so it will pick up about halfway through the class because this is an upper division class so just kind of keep that in mind as these lectures go on so let's go ahead and move on with our chapter one lecture so as I go through here I'm just gonna kinda of put up the, the different bullet points again I apologize this is kind of a history lesson and it's not that exciting but it is very important that you kinda of understand the background of .NET so originally .NET was created to facilitate web-based program uh, mobile uh, programs and what had happened was is that this came about around early 2000s is Microsoft realized that Java was just becoming an extremely popular language and it was just taking a huge chunk out of the the market share and they just kind of reevaluated and say we need a language that can compete with Java when it comes to creating web-based applications mobile applications Windows applications and even um, applications for like Linux and so they came up with what's called dot net they, they did this on purpose you know to compete with Java and just try to make the best lang new language they could and so as you start getting into C sharp you're gonna notice that it is very familiar to C C++ and Java I mean I assume you've probably already had those classes and you'll see the syntax is extremely similar and that's on purpose because Microsoft realized that hey if you create a brand new language that looks nothing like any of these other languages it could be the greatest new programming language ever people aren't gonna adopt it if there's a huge learning curve to it so with C sharp there's a reason that it has curly braces and, and various things like that to make it look like C++ and Java now what they also did is we'll learn about in a second is they also created another language called VB.net so you have C sharp and VB.net as options to use when you're programming .NET so now you need this IDE in order to facilitate writing applications an integrated development environment for something called rapid application development or RAD and the reason I bring this up is because a lot of my students have not even programmed in like a GUI environment yet and this is one of the biggest complaints I get from my students about past classes is all they've created is like console applications they've done C C++ and Java and all they've ever done is console applications in this class you're gonna learn about Windows programming so you have one very simple console application the rest are all Windows applications so it, generally students enjoy this class a little bit more because of that now again just to go where it came from is if you understand what programming languages as they developed I'm not sure if you, maybe you've seen Fortran or maybe read about in some history books Pascal basics and you know of course C that you know over time languages took on more and more features because we needed more out of our programming languages and so these procedural languages like Fortran basic and C you know they, they weren't object oriented but then what happened was is they we needed to figure out a better way to organize our code and that's where you know this the object oriented languages came around like C++ Java and C sharp so the reason something is object oriented is just the way we package our code so if you can remember like C the, the, there weren't really these these structures that everything was in a class where now everything has to be in a class and it's just a way of organizing things better and, and again history has taught us that I mean that that's how because originally we had these procedural languages and they were very top-down and they had a lot of go-to statements but the way you programmed them like so for instance in 
one of the things I learned was I have had to maintain a lot of old programs that were written in the 70s and 80s, and I had to rewrite them in you know the current time. And so what I noticed was is that I had this Fortran, this old Fortran program, but the way it was organized reminded me of object-oriented programming because they would actually put like if there was a, a person like right the idea a person class you would just see a person file so all of the code that dealt with a person like that person object would all just be contained within a file so it was really interesting to see how you know in the older days of programming they still had some concept they tried to organize their code around this object-oriented programming and the nice thing about object-oriented programming is if they're, they're it can kind of make things mimic real world objects. So you could have a class that represents a person, you know, a place, a house, you know, there's all these various things that, you know, they, you encapsulate the attributes of a person, you know, a person is just kind of an easy thing. So you can have social security number, height, weight, you know, all these, these sort of things. And going into .NET, they realize that there's a lot of aspects of it that, that they want to use XML for. So XML is just it's just a language to describe data is really is really all it is. And we're going to use it within .NET. And you're going to see some of the GUI programming languages. We're going to we're going to talk about what's called WPF later on. And you can see it's an XML based language that describes how your UI or user interface should look. Okay, so now we come along and Microsoft invents .NET. So what is .NET? If you've ever heard this term, it's kind of kind of strange why they chose this term .NET. But one of the things they wanted, they realized again, they copied from Java, is that people don't want to be locked into a specific language. So they had this great idea that, hey, let's create what we're going to call this intermediate language, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But we're gonna, above this intermediate language, you can have any language you want. If you meet the rules, you can have C Sharp, you can have Visual Basic, and it doesn't matter which one you use. And so what's nice about that is all those people in the past who loved Visual Basic can now easily morph to VB.NET. Those people who love Java, C++ can use C Sharp, and it does the exact same thing. There's not many advantages you know, one over the other. Now over time, C Sharp has kind of been the, the main language to use, but that's just kind of what's happened. They also wanted to try to make things platform independent. They kind of did okay at this. I think most .NET languages are still mainly used for Windows programming or with web servers. It's getting better. They've, they've done a better job also on the mobile platform. There's some things that have come along so that in the past it was like you could program for like the Windows phone and obviously that's not a market anymore. So they've kind of taking a step back and now there's ways that you can program in .NET and deploy your apps to like an iOS device or an Android device. The next thing they wanted to do is they created this was called ASP.NET or Active Server Pages and this is the web side of .NET. Now we're not we're going to be using um, the web interface in this class. This is a Windows programming class but what's really nice about this is once you learn .NET you know .NET. You know the syntax. You understand how to program for a back-end server in the web world. And then you sort of have to learn just a little bit more because there's a paradigm shift when programming for the internet. So you're going to have to learn some you know, HTML. You're going to have to learn a few other things. But I'm telling you, if you take this class and you springboard into ASP.NET, you become really productive as a web programmer really fast. Another thing that's kind of taken off is the idea of web services. And this is just it's a way of opening up your code to the outside world. Think of it as, you know, maybe I'm a Hertz car rental and I want a partnership with Delta Airlines. So people are going to reserve an airline, but hey, a lot of people also are going to reserve a car rental. So maybe I'm Delta and I say, hey, Hertz or, you know, or National, whoever it is, we get together and we say, hey, give me access to your database through a web service so I can call your code and I can make reservations in your database. That way you're controlling the access that I have to your you know, very sacred data, right? All of your car rental information. So you're not giving me direct access, but you're giving me this web service that I can use. And we can do that with .NET. So let's kind of dive now into the actual features of .NET. So the first thing I want to talk about is the .NET framework itself and what it really is. 
this can be a little bit confusing until you start writing a couple applications. And that's kind of why I say these next parts are probably the part that take some notes on and come back and maybe rewatch this part of the lecture the most. And, and these concepts will make a little bit more sense. So with .NET, you're going to hear us talk about the .NET library, the framework class library. When we talk about this, what that really is, is that is they're just all the classes, it's all the code that Microsoft has written for you. That, that, that's the easiest breakdown. So you don't have to define what it means to write a button or to have like console.out or these millions of other libraries that you can just use for free. When you say .NET, it's all those libraries, this framework class library that you're using. So when you include some things in your code, that's what you're getting. You're saying, hey, Microsoft's already invented what it means to have a button, a label, etc., etc., ways to access databases, and you just have to call into their libraries. So that's what they're talking about with the .NET framework. And so over time, you're going to get new versions of that framework. Now, within that framework, there's something called the common language specification. Now, this is important to understand. You'll probably never worry too much about this, but I want, again, it's good to understand it because this is what's going on underneath the hood. So this is what makes C Sharp and Visual Basic work together because they both define this common language specification. So they adhere to it so that someone can the compiler can take C sharp they can take VB and turn it into this intermediate language but all of your variable types like an integer has to be the same in C sharp that it does in visual basic a long has to be the same and that's what this common language specification deals with so the next thing within the dotnet framework that's really important is this thing called the common language runtime or the CLR and that's what actually executes your program so when you double click an exe C sharp is different than these programs you've probably written in the past for uh, like C++ or C because those are com compiled down to the machine language so you, when you execute it it's executing for that operating system now Java is a little bit different Java acts a lot more like C sharp so with C sharp what happens is you double click that exe now that exe behind the scenes is what's called intermediate language and so this is something that Microsoft created that you can take C Sharp, you can take Visual Basic, and it compiles down into this intermediate language. Sometimes you'll hear it called Microsoft Intermediate Language. Sometimes you'll hear it just called Intermediate Language. I think it's changed over the years, but it's the same thing. And it's just this idea that, you know, there's actually other programming. There's something called like F Sharp. There's Fortran.net. There's other languages all on top of .NET because they all compile down to this intermediate language. So that EXE that you click to run your program, it's actually this intermediate language. And it looks a lot like uh, compiler language. I mean, just a low level, very language. But when you run it, it runs the common language runtime. And that common language runtime kind of asks the question, hey, what operating system am I on? Am I Windows or am I on Linux? Oh, am I on this? What framework am I on? And things like that. So it knows, like, hey, these are the libraries I need to call. It compiles it down to whatever machine you're on. Hey, I'm on Windows 2000. I'm on Windows XP, you know, Windows you know, 11, whatever it is. And it compiles it down into the machine code for that machine. So that's where that big advantage comes in where like a C, C++, you have to know what you're compiling it down to ahead of time. And so again, you'd, it just creates a lot more challenges where .NET, you just give the executable and, and they can run it as long as they have the .NET framework installed on your computer. So that's the next thing you have to remember is that this, this framework is what has to be installed on a computer. So let's pretend you're taking this class and you're gonna write your tic-tac-toe program, a program we write in this class. And now you want your kid, you want your grandma, you want your spouse, whoever it is, a friend to run this program because you just think it's awesome. If you want to just copy that file onto their computer and run that exe, you have to make sure that they have the right .NET version on there. So, you know, if you wrote this program with version 3.5 and they have a later version you're probably going to be fine because it you generally is generally backwards compatible not always but it, it most of the time it is but now if you wrote this in 4.5 but they only have 3.5 installed on their system or if they don't have the dotnet framework it's just not going to run you're going to see this little error message pop up now what you can do is you could create an installer and that installer would first install the dotnet framework and then it would install your exe so there's always ways like again if this was a commercial 
application, you would make sure that you deliver also the .NET, the specific version of the .NET framework that's needed um, for your application. And then again, uh, you know, just to talk about the .NET languages of C# -sharp and VB. C# -sharp has pretty well become the main language for .NET. But again, it doesn't have to be because everything compiles down to that intermediate language. It, it's kind of fun because you can actually reverse engineer code. You can actually take an EXE and you can reverse engineer it into C Sharp. You can reverse engineer it into VB.NET. And if that doesn't raise your eyes in the sense of computer science and that, that nerdy hackerness of, hey, I've got this EXE, I wouldn't want someone to reverse engineer the code. We'll talk about some tools later on that you can, what's called obfuscation, where we can actually kind of hide the code. It makes it harder to reverse engineer code. It's never perfect, but it is kind of a way of like, if you have this intellectual property, right? You came up with a very significant math algorithm. You're, de you're deploying it, you're selling it on the internet. You obviously wouldn't want someone else you know, to be able to steal that intellectual property of yours. But .NET makes that a little bit tricky, but it, it's generally not too big, big a deal. There aren't too many people that are out there just to reverse engineer code and steal your code, but that's something you need to keep in mind. So .NET languages, this class we're going to be using C Sharp, and hopefully enjoy it. And that's it for today.